Okay, it works. So the talk that I'm going to give you today could fall maybe under three different titles, okay? One of them would be um, mathematics is everywhere in my life, okay? No matter where I go, I end up using mathematics. Another one could be how do I bring my loves of family, cars, mathematics, and students together? So it's gonna, you're going to see essentially that. The other one is how do we reach a lot of our youth today who really think that mathematics has nothing to do with them? And this, is, uh, this lecture series is part of a, of a thing called Mathematics is Cool, where I try to bring them in. So let's, um, let's go forward. Okay. So the objective of this is to promote an appreciation for mathematics among students who may believe that mathematics has nothing to do with their world. This comes from Saknas News. Okay. So there you see uh, a Tejano, born in California, and a 57 Chevy, where I don't know where it was born. But this, this, this actually got to the White House, because I got a remark from Neil Lane and Bill Clinton on this thing. And what Neil Lane said was, I was looking for the centerfold, and I couldn't find it. And, <laughs> and I said, Neil, you don't want to look for that, OK? OK, so the, what am I thinking? Has mathematics improved the quality of my life, or has it made it just dull and one-dimensional person? And so the answer to that is, no, I think my mathematical training enters into everything that I do and has definitely made my life more enjoyable and more interesting. It has allowed me to combine three of my loves, family, cars, and math, and students. In this talk, I hope to demonstrate these facts to you. It has various segments. Now, the segments that we're going to see is going to be the first one there, fair lane selection in BMX bicycle racing. And uh, so we're going to see an application of how this came into my life. And then we're going to see uh, the fourth one, which is over here. It says, fusing art and math through cars, the construction of a psychedelic video. The other ones we save for some other time. Okay. All right, let's go over here. OK, so here's this called The Curse of the Last Lane, Lane 8, Fair Lane Assignment in BMX Bicycle Racing. So you're going to learn a little bit about BMX and a little bit about how we use math to, to make BMX better. So um, OK. 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 So, so here's, 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 here's BMX, Bicycle Motocross. An exciting sport for boys and girls which promotes strong family interaction. Let me show you a video. In the video, you're going to see the ultimate. You're going to see the pros. You're going to see an example of people who make their life doing this. And then you're going to go all the way to the other extreme. We're going to see five-year-olds, really cute five-year-olds. So let's watch this video. Now, this is, uh, this is Pete Longkarevich out of San Pedro, California, one of the greatest pros of all time. So these are all, people are all pros riding very good. Now, look, Longkarevich is beating everybody. The pros know that they can't beat him, and they know they're professionals, so they have to look good. So look over this series of jumps. What they're going to do, they say, we haven't won, so we have to look good. So they have to get style, and they look very good because they know they're not going to win. And Longkarevich goes on to win the race. Okay? So now we're going to see a five-year-old who's the son of one of my friends. And here comes Russell Kelly. So you see, there were the pros. And there's the five-year-old, Russell Kelly. So see how cute. In the next shot, you see that's my wife and my daughter. And we're not related to the Easter Bunny, OK? The only thing you have to say is that you hope that that was Easter Sunday. Otherwise, uh, that costume doesn't make sense, OK? <laughs> so what did we see? Here's what we saw. A short race encountering numerous jumps and turn obstacles. Now, the way you qualify in, in BMX uh, racing is there's three motos. So you get three chances to win a race. So you line up, and you race. And if you win, you get to sit down. If you lose, you come back and race a second time. If you win that one, you sit down. If you lose, you come back in a third. And if you don't win the first, the second, or the third moto, you're out, and you don't advance to the next round. If you do win a moto, you just get to sit down and wait. And so it's very important that you win one of the motos. Now, 
The curse of the last lane. Look at lane eight over there. It's much further to go than it is in lane one or lane three. So lane three is considered the very best lane. And in the next slide, I'm going to show you why. Look at the last lane, lane eight. You have to go a lot further. You go way outside. You, you have to travel. Lane one, you have to turn a corner really, really tight. And somebody can just block you on that. So the best shot is lane three. So what you would like to do is get lane three. And it's a random draw. So usually what you do is you pick out of an urn that has numbers your lane. And you get, or sometimes they have a deck of cards. But it's all a random draw. And so what you really would like to have is lane three. Now if you get lane eight, it's very hard to win out of lane eight. So in a highly competitive national meet, is it possible to win out of the last lane? So let's look at a little bit of old video here and see what we can say. So watch my friend Billy's son Russell and my son Richard. And they're going to show us that it's very difficult to win out of the last lane, lane eight. So here comes Russell, a cute five-year-old. He's trying to come out. He's on the outside, so he's in the last lane. He has to cut inside. He tries to cut inside. Cut inside, Russell. Go inside. Boom. Crash. Boom. Okay, he gets run over. Okay. Now here's my son Richard. Look, Richard is uh, on your on your far right. He's gonna. He's very competitive. He tries to cut inside here. He's in lane eight. He's gonna come in and he goes over the berm and out of the race. Okay. So th this was supposed to show you that it's very difficult to win out of the last lane or lane eight, okay? However, it's possible. So we're gonna watch my niece, my twin brother, uh, Bobby's daughter, and my son, Richard. And here we go. So here's Julie. Julie is uh, closest to you, and she's furthest from the turn, so Julie has to ride into So she's coming in, Julie, go. She's gonna try to come inside. Now this is a national meet, and this is a California rider, so Julie has to get inside. Go inside, Julie. Cut right inside right here. She cuts inside, she knocks her down, and she goes on and wins the race. <laughs> OK? So now this is Richard. Now watch Richard. Richard can't cut inside, so he stays all the way on the top, and he rides the outside into a beautiful first place. Now the, the second place rider, is a, I know who it was. It was a rider from California. This was a Texas meet. He's, gonna, he's thinking right now, I have to take Richard out. I'm going to take him out. And Richard knows that the guy's going to come in and take him out. So watch right here. He says, I'm going to T-bone Richard right about now. And Richard holds on and goes in and reigns the race, see? So, so I showed you that even though it's very hard, it is possible to win out of lane eight. It's not very likely. OK, so here's a mathematical challenge. Develop a BMX lane assignment process that is as fair as possible to all riders and can be implemented on any given track. In this process, a rider should never be assigned three lane eights or even two. This all started because one time we went to Shreveport, Louisiana, and my son, who was very competitive, pulled three lane eights in a row and, of course, didn't qualify. So on the way home, I said, we should be able to use mathematics to fix this flaw. So what do you do, what do, you do when you have a problem that needs to be solved? Well, you call in a very competent graduate student. Okay? And that's exactly what I did. You're going to see this. First, I had a, a summer student who was an undergraduate, and he just tried to do exhaustive searches with the computer, and, and he didn't come up with anything. So then we had a graduate student, and the graduate student who solved this problem is here with us today, and he's going to tell you how he solved this problem. Ed? Thank you, Dr. Tapia. When, um, when I first came into uh, Rice Graduate School about uh, many years ago, let's just say, uh, Dr. Tapia came up to me and said, I know you like math. And I thought in my head, yeah, math is cool. He's like, do you like BMX racing? I'm like, well, it's cool. I don't know much about it, but it's pretty cool. He's like, what do you think about doing a problem with uh, math that involves mathematics and BMX racing? I was like, super cool. Let's do it. You know, I was really excited. You know, it's a, it's a math problem. Uh, that's, in a sense, it's a non-traditional math problem for something that has a real cool application. So I was really excited. So I said, what's the problem? So the problem was basically, like he just stated, BMX, in a sense, can be unfair. Okay, if you, let's say you only have three chances to advance, right? There's only three motos. If you happen to draw 
the worst lane in all three modos, the chances of ad advancing is basically gone because it's very, very difficult to do that. But uh, it's also just, if you happen to draw the worst lane twice, you basically you only have one opportunity to advance. And so, and that's really unfair as well. So what Dr. Tapio wanted to do is do, uh, get a mathematical model that makes it fair for all riders to advance. And that's where I came in. So, but we wanted to make sure that this could be implemented in any track, any general track, no matter, no matter if lane three was the best lane or lane four was the best lane or lane five was the best lane. So what we decided to do is instead of working with lanes, we're gonna work with a priority system. That means we don't, we don't really care which lane is the best because we're just gonna call one, let one represent the best lane in your given track. We're gonna let two represent the second best lane in your given track. We're gonna let three represent the third best lane in your any given track and so on and so forth. So basically, by doing this, we leave the responsibility to the track, to people at the track, the people who know the track better, to, to assign the lanes. All we're doing is working with the priorities, the ranks, which one is the best lane, which is the second best lane, which is a, the third best lane. And what we wanted to do is, from a mathematical point of view, give the riders the best opportunity to advance. Basically, an optimal assignment of lanes. So here's an example of the priority system. Right? There's eight lanes, like Dr. Tapia just showed. So the priorities would be one, two, three, all the way to eight. In track number one, for example, the best lane would be lane three. In track number two, the, sec in track number two, the best lane would be lane four. In track number one, the third best lane is lane two. In track number two, the third best lane is lane six. So just by working with the priorities, all we're doing is working with the ranks. Which one is, is uh, whatever, which one assigning those ranks is up to the people at the track. Since we don't know the track, they know it better. So that's why we just work with priorities. So this is our, our breakthrough idea. Typically, in BMX racing, the lanes are assigned randomly, one by one. But uh, by doing that, you have the opportunity, or somebody may draw uh, the worst lane three times, or e even two times. Or maybe they draw the second worst lane three times, which is almost just as bad. So our breakthrough idea was, instead of drawing for one lane at a time, how about we draw for all three modos at a time? So basically, you get your lane assignment for modo one, modo two, and modo three all at the same time. And, and that, we give a, everybody, in a sense, an equal opportunity throughout the whole round, because you have three opportunities to advance, right? You, have, you give everybody a, a fair opportunity throughout the whole round to advance to the next round, which is basically what we're trying to do. So and by doing this, this ensures that we have some sense of fairness. Right? That's what we're going after. We want to make sure that the lane assignments in all three modos uh, are fair for all eight riders. So, so as you can imagine, no triple, that's what we call it, right? Every rider is going to get three, uh, three lane assignments or priority assignments. And none of them should have three, uh, three eights because that would be a bad triple. So here's an example of the triples given out. Uh, rider one has a triple of five, two, six, representing the fifth uh, best lane, the second best lane, and the sixth best lane. Rider two has a, a triple of two, four, seven, representing the second best lane, the fourth best lane, and the seventh best lane. So what we have here, we have a set of eight triples, one for each rider. Okay. So you might be wondering, isn't the curse of lane eight rare? I mean, how unlucky do you have to be to draw uh, eight, the worst lane, three times? Okay. As it turns out, it happens more often than one might think. 1.56% of all, of, of all set of eight triples ha contains at least one triple with three eights. So it occurs more often than you might think. But what was more astonishing to me, how many set of eight triples have uh, a, a triple with two uh, lane, lane assignments to lane eight? One third of all set of eight triples has at least one triple with uh, two lanes that are extremely bad. So basically, that one third of the time, one rider is only gonna have one real opportunity to advance to the next round, which is extremely unfair. And that's what we tried to, to fix. Okay. So what we came up with, we came up with, uh, like we, I said, a priority, um, a priority ranking. So we're not working with lanes, remember, we're working with priorities. And what we did, to, we, want to get, we want to sum up the priorities for each, each rider, right? We want to sign up, uh, sum up the triples that each rider gets. The priority stuff. Uh, in order to uh, ensure fairness, what, what, we want, what would we like to do? We would like for all riders to have equivalent priority sums. So we want to find a set of eight triples where the priority sum of all riders are basically the same. Okay. 
So we, we do have some constraints. There's only one rider per lane in each moto. Okay, like for example, the, the first set of eight triples is, is a feasible set. For each column, which represents each moto, the, the lanes one through eight are only assigned once. But if you see in the second set of eight triples, the number seven is assigned twice in the second column or the second moto. So therefore, that would be an infeasible set of eight triples. Okay. So what is the fairest feasible set of eight triples? How do, how do we measure this? So we want the maximum priority sum to minus the minimum priority sum. That's going to be our unfairness measure, right? If you have a, a set of eight triples, well, you take the, the maximum priority sum as we define it, and you subtract the, uh, the, the minimum priority sum, what you're basically doing is you're saying the best lane, you're taking the difference between the best triple and the worst triple, and you want to minimize that. You want to make it as close as possible. So that's, a, that's, a, that's our optimization problem. That's how we formulated this problem, in a sense. So the total, total priority in a moto, there's eight lanes, right? There's eight lanes. So you rank the lanes one through eight. The total priority is 36. It's three motos. Three times 36 is 108. So it's basically 108, in a sense, 108 ranking to divide amongst the riders. Since there's eight riders, each rider, in order for us to get for every triple to be uh, exactly the same in, in a sense of priorities, should be each triple should be equal to 13.5. Okay? But that leads us to a problem. Uh, priorities are integers. Mm -hmm. So if, if we had three integers, uh, I don't think we could get 13.5. Is that right, Dr. Uh, so, so since that's the case, we can't, we can't get, we can't get 13.5, so we want to get as close as possible to it. So that's what we try to do. We try to squeeze it. So what we're trying to do, we can't get 13.5. What's the closest integers to 13.5? 13 and 14, right? So that's what we wanted to do. So we set up the system of linear equations, which basically we have x represents the riders that have a priority sum of 13, and y represents the riders that have a priority sum of 14. There's eight riders in total, so x plus y should equal eight. And the whole prior, uh, priority sum, priority, the whole um, the sum of priorities over three motos is 108. Therefore, all riders with priority sum of 13 plus all riders uh, priority sum of 14 so sum up to eight. So we have, we have those linear equations, and it comes up with a unique solution. So this tells us right here, if we have a solution, that means four of the riders is going to have to have a priority sum of, of 13, and four of the riders have to have a priority sum of 14. Okay. So by, by doing a selective search algorithm, where we basically threw out a lot of solutions at, at one time, we, in less than one second, we found 7,812 optimal solutions. And then we said, wow, that's great. I was really excited as a graduate student. I solved the problem. And when the Dr. Tapion said, you didn't solve the problem, 7,812 solutions is way too many. So what that usually means is we don't have enough information in the model. So what we did is we went back and we put more information in the model. So uh, here's one of the optimal solutions that we actually found. Uh, over here, we see the set of eight triples. Remember, we're working with priorities. So the first triple right there is 176. In a particular track, that triple 176 corresponds to lengths 3, 7, and 6. Even though the priority sum is 14 of that first triple, the, the sum of the lengths is not necessarily 13 or 14. Remember, because we're working with priorities and we're not working with lengths. Okay. But we have too many solutions, like I said, so that's, that's why we said, I, like I said, we have to put more information in the moto. Okay, so if you win the first moto, then you don't, you don't have to compete in the, in the second moto because you already advanced the next round, like Dr. Tapia said. So all things being equal, what, what's the chance or the probability of a rider advancing in, in the second round? Well, you have a one-seventh probability. What, what's, the, what's the chances of a rider advancing in the, in the first round, in the first moto? It's one-eighth, because there's eight, eight riders. What's the uh, chances or probability of a, a rider advancing in the third moto? It's one-sixth, because the, the, the riders who, run the, who won the first two moto are no longer, no longer participating. So therefore, so what we decided to do is we decided to weight the priorities in each moto by either one-eighth, one-seven, or one-sixth, depending on the moto. Okay, so here's our weighted priority sum, which I just described. So, like I said, we just weighted the priorities of each moto, and we summed up the priority, the priority sums of all sets of eight triples. Our objective is still the same. We want to we minimize, basically, the unfairness factor. Okay, and uh, as it turns out, we had success. We got one unique solution when we did this, and this is our unique solution. So, uh, right here we see like, the priority, uh, 175 of that triple, that priority sums up to 13. It, it may correspond to a lane assignment of 371 in one track. 
But the, the cool part about this is we got one solution. So we kind of, me and Dr. Tapia looked at each other and said, you know what, we put enough information, let's go home. So not only did the riders notice, because actually in Houston area, some Houston tracks actually implemented the system. Instead of drawing for one lane, they drew, out, they drew for all three lanes or priorities at the same time. So the, it seemed like the riders were catching on or they accepted the system, a mathematically based system actually accepted in sports, which is kind of cool. So, but um, not only did the writers know, the, the biggest newspaper in the Houston area, they, uh, they caught wind of the story, and uh, the Houston Chronicle, and uh, they wrote an article on it, which is really exciting. So um, I'll give it back to doc, uh, Dr. Tapia, and thank you so much. Okay, so we, we used mathematics, and my son, and my niece, and a graduate student, and we made the world a better place, okay? <laughs> I've actually had emails Believe me, I've had emails from Australia, from other places say, in Australia we do this a little differently. Could you modify your model to accept that? And we said, of course. And so we, you know, it, was, it, it was good. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go on to another application. And this one has a little bit of a different flavor. But this is fusing art and mathematics through cars. The construction of a psychedelic show car video. So first I show you. My wife and I have a lot of cars, a lot of toys. Let me show you some of them. This is a 78 Datsun 280Z. Now here's the thing to take out of it. Since I grew up in Los Angeles at a time where we used to work on low riders, this is a sports car. And sports cars people are very, very meticulous and, and really definite about how they want. So I did the paint work on this thing and I kind of turned it into a sports car into a low rider. A lot of people didn't like that, okay? But that was me. So that's one of our cars. Here's a 57 Chevy, which is another one of the cars. But the one that this video is about is our latest car. It's a 1970 Chevelle Malibu SS. That's it, OK? It's a national champion. We won every prestigious show in the United States last year. We took the Grand National Show in Pomona. We took, uh, in Pomona again, we took the uh, Super Chevy show that we won best of show. So this is a serious toy. It's a very serious toy, okay? There it is. Now those of you from California, from Los Angeles can recognize that's on top of Mulholland Drive, okay? It's, okay. It's Fire Station 105 on Mulholland Drive in Coldwater Canyon, okay? Um, we had one of, one of my students' friends draw a monster underneath the hood. So that's, the engine is a Corvette engine and the monster is just um, one of our uh, local artists did that. That's the engine. This is the interior. It always wins best interior. Uh, it was done, it's completely hand formed interior that's done in California. There's the uh, trunk area that's on display. That's in Houston, Texas. There's uh, in one of the magazines on the cover of another magazine. Um, now here's what I want to share with you. This is an important message right here. The entire family helps prepare this car. So here you have my son and daughter actually working and cleaning on the car. This next shot is extremely important for me. This is my wife. Now Jean, for those of you who know her, has multiple sclerosis and has to navigate life in a wheelchair. But that doesn't stop her from going with us and traveling with us and cleaning the car. So Jean has just as much fun and excitement getting in there and cleaning the car as Becky and Richard did. And she's in there all the time. Now, there they are celebrating that the car is clean and ready to go. And we go to the show and we win. And they clean and I get the trophies, OK? <laughs> I mean, that's the way, I mean, that's, that's the way it's supposed to be, okay? <laughs> now, we decided that this car needed a theme. So the theme we called, we all the family got together, we argued on many themes, but we decided to call the car Heavy Metal. So we choose the theme for our 70 Chevelle called Heavy Metal. Now, here's the mathematical challenge. I would love to use mathematics to create a psychedelic video that will be a part of the car exhibit. So as we go across the country, I have five monitors, and I want to show a video that is kind of funky, kind of psychedelic, but definitely, definitely done with mathematics. Definitely done with mathematics. So again, we are uh, you know, confronted with a very difficult mathematical challenge. So what do you do? You call in a student, OK? 
Now this student that we're going to call in, I didn't really, I hadn't worked with him, but I knew that he was a math major and an art major and a Chicano from the barrios of Houston, okay? What a great combination to accomplish what I want. So the next, what we accomplished with this video, this student, Joseph Cifuentes, will come up and tell you about it just the way Ed did. So Joseph. Well, first off, I'd like to say it's an incredible honor uh, to be here speaking before you. Many years ago, as an undergrad, I came to Saknas and I was very wide-eyed as I went to all the different booths and saw all the different successes of all the people that looked like me and had stories like me. And it meant a lot to me to see that there were so many people who cared and who achieved. And uh, to be able to speak before you now uh, really means a lot to me. Thank you. So let me tell you a story about how I met Dr. Richard Tapia. I actually uh, had, when I was in high school, a part-time job at U of H as an office assistant, just doing odd ends here and there. And someone heard that I was going to go to Rice. And they said, have you ever heard of Dr. Richard Tapia? I said, no, I never heard of him. They said, yeah, he's this Chicano over there. He's a mathematician. You should go talk to him. So when I went to Rice, I made sure to go find this Chicano mathematician that I've heard about. And I eventually enrolled in his summer research program. And he called me into his office and he said, Joseph, I've got this car. <laughs> I said, OK, you know, OK. And it's a 1970 Chevelle Super Sport. And then he got my attention. I said, That's cool, I like cars. And he said, You know, I want a video where the car morphs into fire and I want it to explode and I want fire to be shooting in all different places and I want the car to turn into fire. And I thought, so this is the great Richard Tapia. He's crazy. <laughs> and I told him, I said, look, you know, I paint murals in the barrio and I paint paintings. I don't know how to do any of this stuff. He said, Joseph, we'll pay you. I said, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> so I actually took this job really from the perspective of an artist because art was something that was very serious to me. My dad's an artist. I've worked as an artist. I majored in art as well as mathematics. But I, it was something that I was always separate. I always had my artistic side over here, my Chicano side over there, my mathematician side over there. And here I had the opportunity before me to take all the different aspects of me and put it together. So I really wanted to make that an important part uh, of the project. Right? So as an artist, I had to say, what am I trying to accomplish here? What am I trying to express, right? I mean, I want a, a car show video that's going to be cool, right? It's got to be exciting. It's got to wow the judges at the car shows, right? It's got to have street cred, right? But it also has to be a, a piece of artwork. It has to have a theme. It has to have the elements, the, all the different elements have to point to this one theme that points to heavy metal music and muscle cars, because really heavy metal mu music and muscle cars are part of one rebellious movement that was really uh, a, a very exciting and powerful culture in the 70s. And I wanted to try and capture that feeling as an artist. What was really important to me also is, as an undergraduate starting to get my feet wet in the world of research, I had to say, OK, is this project important? Right? When we do things in research, we want to say, is it important? Is it hard? Is it challenging? And when I finally realized that this could be important as an outreach activity as a way to show people who will follow behind me to say, look, you can use mathematics to create beautiful things the way people before me, like Dr. Tapia, has showed me, then it's important. And it means a lot. And it'll be important to the world of mathematics. So I had an artwork of found materials. I found a 1970 Chevelle, but I couldn't keep it because it didn't belong to me. I found a collage of photos and muscle car ads from the 70s that really, I thought, captured the theme of what I was trying to capture. And I found the Navier-Stokes partial differential equations and singular value decomposition. This is something I found at Rice University. I didn't know about this beforehand. Now, what is that? Well, these are the Navier-Stokes partial differential equations. There's a bounty on these PDEs. If you can get a closed form solution of these PDEs, you win a million dollars from the Clay Foundation. OK, so y'all can get started on the back of your napkins working it out while I give my talk. And if you solve it, come to speak to me after the, after the lecture. 
Now, we can't write a closed form solution, but what we can do is come up with innovative ways to get numerical approximations. And one of the ways that I learned is finite element. I was actually, at the time, working on a rather sane uh, research project in the mechanical engineering department where I was using finite element to solve Navier-Stokes to solve uh, how fluid flows over different objects because that's what the Navier-Stokes equations uh, model. It's a partial differential equation model of how fluid flows over objects. So I discretized space into a, a finite elements and rather than looking uh, for the exact solution, I look in a finite dimensional space of functions and try and find the best solution out of that space using essentially uh, supercomputers running in parallel to solve over this because even though we break continuous space into a discrete set of, of triangular elements, we have lots of elements in order to get a good solution. So this actually took hours on a supercomputer to actually render the solution through uh, the XNS code that we used. And this is the kind of things that we got. Now I actually didn't get this at first. Uh, because I was an engineer, I said, well, okay, as an engineer, how would I do this? I have the car and cars go on the ground and they go on the ground and fluid goes over them. Or in, in the practical sense, why we think wind, wind goes over the car. So I did that and it looked to be actually really boring, right? Because it turns out a Chevelle is really well designed. The fluid goes over the car, down the back, and goes away, right? Accurate, physically sound, engineering sound, but not cool, right? We have to do something that's cool. And I couldn't really figure out how to do something that's cool because I was really thinking from the perspective of an engineer. I was trying to be safe, right? I'm getting paid to do a job, so I wanted to do a good job. I didn't want to go off on a ledge and do something crazy. So I went and talked to Dr. Thapi and I said, you know, I've been trying all these things and I really can't get anything to work. I really, you know, I really don't know what I'm doing here. And I've tried uh, all these different things and they haven't come out at all. He said, well, oh, that's great. I said, well, you must not have heard of me. I said, nothing's working. I'm trying all these new things and it's not working. He said, no, what's great is that you're trying new things. You're a student, and by trying new things, things that you've never done before, you're, it's bound to not work at first, and that's okay. Because you don't tell people about your failures, you tell people about your successes. But still, I tell you now about a little bit of my failures because in the end, I did, I did succeed. Um, so this actually really opened my eyes to try new things, to try radical things, things that I never would have considered before. So I said, okay, let's let the Chevelle fly. So I lifted it up off the ground, I let fluid go over, I let fluid go underneath, and then the fluid fought for the low pressure spot behind and created a frequency called vortex shedding, which is actually what you're gonna see in the video. You see the fluid going around the Chevelle, and you see this uh, vortex shedding as the fluid fights for that low pressure space behind the car. So I got these really interesting effects, and then I said, okay, now what can I do? Well, what if the fluid didn't go around the Chevelle, but what if the Chevelle was the fluid? What if the Chevelle was the fire? And then I get something like this, right? Imagine having a swimming pool in the shape of Chevelle, and you have certain boundary conditions of where the fluid comes in and where it can escape. And what I did, actually, is I had an inflow condition. I said, okay, the fluid's gonna come in in a certain part, but I had no outflow condition, right? Which means if you have fluid coming into something, and there's no way for it to get out, you're gonna have increasing pressure, increasing pressure, increasing pressure. Actually, as the pressure increased, it actually broke the code. The code wasn't converging anymore. It was, so I got something that even though physically, at the end, wasn't realistic, it sure did look cool. You know? so that's, and that's really all that mattered in this case. I was getting something that looked cool. I was actually going beyond the physics of the problem and using mathematics to create uh, really interesting video effects. And then I started thinking, well, you know, I have all these finite elements because you have a very fine mesh, but what if I played with the mesh spacing? What if I could say I want this really smooth, accurate solution to be the Chevelle, but I wanted the background to be a choppy solution? Would I be able to see the Chevelle? And then I got something like that, where physically there's no difference between the Chevelle and outside the Chevelle, but you have a really fine mesh and a really sparse mesh outside. And the accuracy of the solution, or in some sense the smoothness of the solution, becomes the car. And the unaccuracy or the unsmoothness or the coarseness of the solution becomes the background. So now the car has ceased to have any kind of physical meaning and has purely a computational or numerical meaning. And it was actually around this time that I changed my major from mechanical engineering to mathematics because I became so enamored with where mathematics can take me. And I became so in love with how these, uh, how these algorithms worked and how it was able to give me the results I was getting. So another thing I learned is singular value decomposition. So singular value decomposition is a way to, to uh, decompose matrices. Matrices being an array 
of numerical values, right? Well, we can think of pictures that way, right? As an array of pixels. And the value of the pixel relates to the color of the pixel, right? Now, if we look at maybe one column of pixels, and it looks just like the next column of pixels, well, then the computer ha doesn't have to remember both columns. It could just remember some of the columns and just say, I know that these columns look like each other or are a scaling of these columns. Or maybe they're a linear combination of the preceding columns. And that we can actually compress pictures into something that's going to take up less space on a memory. And I said, well, how can I use that to make cool stuff? So I said, OK, let me take this picture here, which has 450 columns of pixels. And what if I took some away and said some of the columns are actually just combinations of other columns? What if I took it to 100 columns and made 450 by combining these columns in different ways? I still get actually a picture that looks relatively well, right? It looks really good. Well, I'll take it down more and more, and then it starts to get a little blurry, but I really want to destroy it. I mean, I really want to just tear this car apart, right? Because that's what heavy metal is about. You know, you break your, you break your guitar, you break the drums, you break the car. So I really took it all the way until it was gone. So I have my mathematical elements creating special effects, but I also wanted to incorporate the sociological themes of what was going on. It is rebellion, heavy metal music, and muscle cars, and how it was all part of one big bad thing. So I have rebellion. Ed Gonzalez that spoke here before actually graduated from Berkeley. But he didn't start that, though. That wasn't him. <laughs> heavy metal music. What's really interesting about this picture is when I talk to outreach audiences and I talk to kids, and I say, okay, who is that? And it's always the kid in the back row with the long hair and black nail polish who raises his hand and says, oh, that's Jimmy Page. And the teacher says, he's never answered a question ever. <laughs> and muscle cars. We actually found this at a swap meet at one of the car shows. I've, I've gone with Dr. Tapia to several of the car shows. In fact, I went with him to Pomona. Uh, to the Grand National Car Show, which is one of the biggest in the country and definitely the best car show I've ever been to. Anyway, at one of these shows, we found this ad from 1970. So this is one of the ads that I put into the show. So you have to look for it because it goes quick. And now we have the movie. Okay. Big hand for Joseph and for Ed, okay? Thank you. So say, the whole theme is math is cool, and I want to thank all of you for sharing with us our love, all our loves, and go forth and continue to do all these good things. Thank you very much.